Hi, I'm Lily Bosworth. Thank you for listening in today. I am currently a master's student in hydrologic science and engineering at Colorado School of Mines. And I have been doing research over the past couple of years with uh, the University of Utah and at Wild Utah Project on beaver dam analogs and hydrology. Today, I'm going to talk about what happens to the water when we restore streams with beaver dam analogs. And I've conducted this research with Paul Brooks at the U of U and with Logan Jamison. I'd like to take a moment and acknowledge that this research was conducted on the traditional lands of Eastern Shoshone, Goshute, and Ute people. We respect the history and culture of indigenous people that are part of Utah's community at the University of Utah and at Wild Utah Project. Diving into beaver dam analogs, we know that they are porous dams made of wooden posts, sticks, rocks, and mud installed in series. Those series can be as small as maybe three dams and they can be up to over 50 dams, just depending on the restoration site. We know that beaver dams mimic ecosystem services. They have been shown to create more fish habitat, um, even increasing in one study, they increased the population of stillhead trout at a site in Oregon. They have been shown to increase riparian vegetation and they have been shown to prevent erosion and even encourage sediment aggradation, raising the bed of the stream. We also know that BDAs are affordable and easy to install. And for these reasons, they're increasingly popular and their implementation has sometimes outpaced the science around them. And so we have some questions that have been raised, especially about how they change the stream flow. So what we don't know about BDAs is if they significantly change the volume of water that flows into the stream, which is really important for people downstream that have water rights. Um, they could store water in the stream and in the banks of the stream, and they could change the amount of water that evaporates out of the stream. These unknowns have created competing perceptions about what happens to the water when we restore streams in this way. And one of my favorite illustrations of this is this, um, one of the very first conceptual models presented by Pollock et al. in 2014 of beaver dam analogs and how they change stream morphology. And here you can see that up top, there is this thin blue line in this model that represents the groundwater table. And as you step through time, the stream gets healthier, there's more vegetation and um, diverse stream morphology. And at the end, this groundwater table is up a lot higher than it started, which is great for the ecosystem, but we don't actually have data that proves that's what happens. It's just a conceptual model. So that leads me to uh, my field site, Fish Creek, which is located about an hour drive northeast of Salt Lake City. It is a first order stream that flows into Chalk Creek, which is um, a tributary to the Weber River right above Echo Reservoir. And um, so my study site is here on the right. And then um, there's also this Chalk Creek gauge station that is run by the USGS and they measure stream flow right before Chalk Creek hits Echo Reservoir and joins the Weber River. So when I think about the water at Fish Creek, I think about it existing in three zones. The first is the surface water. So the stuff we see flowing in the stream, uh, the stuff that most of us care about a lot. And then the second is the groundwater, which is also very important because it interacts with the surface most of the time. And the third is atmospheric water. So clouds, humidity, anything in the air. And thinking about Fish Creek, which is shown here in this photo, um, thinking about it as a box, so uh, a 3D box, and what we see here is what we get. We can think about the amount of water that's in this box as represented by maybe this much volume. And so water is flowing into the box and water is flowing out of the box. And we want to know what the change is in the store in the amount of water that's stored in the box. And so when water flowing in and water flowing out is equal, then change is equal to zero. 
but when we add BDAs, do we maybe dam water and store some water? Um, that could look something like this, where we increase the amount of water in the system, but at least for a time, there could be less water flowing out until that new steady state is reached. And so this raises the questions of how much water are we storing, if any, is it enough to um, have us really care about the amount of water that's stored? And if we do store water, where does it go? It, does it sit in the stream on the surface mostly? Does it go into the ground or does it evaporate into the air? So to uh, try and measure this, first I measured in stream flow, which meant me going and standing out in the stream like is shown here and measuring discharge. I measured discharge and stream depth at two points um, in control and BDA reaches as well as before and after the BDAs were installed. So conceptually that looks like it does here. And taking those discharge and depth measurements, I was able to create a, a plot or a relationship between those two values. So that looks like uh, these here where depth is the X and discharge is the Y. And I get these equations at each point that I can then plug 15 minute depth data that I collected uh, from each point into these equations. So this 15 minute data is X and I get a 15 minute discharge as Y. And that's really helpful because I was only able to measure discharge uh, every one to two weeks, uh, summer 19 through fall 2019. And so this gives me a lot more continuous idea of what the stream flow looked like at Fish Creek. Moving on and thinking about groundwater, I used physometers, which are groundwater wells for just shallow groundwater, at most a couple meters deep, that were installed and they were just PVC pipes screened over the bottom foot to allow water to seep in. And uh, holes were dug by hand, so it was pretty cobbly substrate and I wasn't able to get a, a ton of physometers in, but enough to give us an idea of what happened. Visually, that looks like this, where I have uh, these BDA-influenced physometers in the BDA reach and right below it, and then control physometers uh, far above where the, the dams could have an influence. And in cross-section, uh, another schematic that, that shows what these are trying to measure is if the groundwater table elevation changes, then we can see that the pisometers would, would show this little increase and we can start to estimate a volume of water stored in the system that way. And I did this not just in these zones, but I, I had pisometers in before the BDAs were installed and after so I could make that comparison as well. Third is that atmospheric water zone. I tried to measure evaporation and transpiration, which are lumped into evapotranspiration with a meteorological station that looked like this. It was located uh, downstream and off to the side of the BDA site. And it turned out that the station placement was too far away from the BDA reach to measure any significant changes. And it was placed this way just because I could put it in a fenced area where I knew it would be safe from cows that really like to rub on this kind of thing and um, scratch their itches, but maybe also do some damage to the instruments. So summing this, all together, what this looked like in the field was my weather station was all the way down here. You can see it's really far away from the site. And then I had pisometers uh, here in the control reach and then in the BDA reach. And then two flow measurement points uh, downstream from the BDAs and upstream from the BDAs. Next, we got to install the, the Beaver Dam analogs. There were 17 dams installed in this reach. And these pictures show what just a, a little section of the stream looked like before BDA installation and after. And we can see that there is definitely some water stored, at least on the surface. And so that's really cool, but we want to be sure that we're not storing so much water that it's impacting stream flow. So to start looking at data now that the dams were installed, I went back to that Chalk Creek data. And I looked at 10 year historical stream flow from Chalk Creek and I looked at 2019 stream flow. So the 10 year average is this dotted line. 
And then 2019 for Chalk Creek is the dark blue solid. And 2019 for Fish Creek is the light blue. And what we see here is that Fish Creek and Chalk Creek are approximately the same. Uh, Fish Creek was a, a little bit higher stream flow at some points in time than Chalk Creek. That could be because there are some diversions along Chalk Creek before the USGS station, and so that could impact stream flow. But uh, 2019 was also a little bit larger than average at both sites. Zooming in on this uh, zone right here, this is where I focused my data analysis because Beaver Dam analogs were installed in late August right here. And so we can see that while there was some variation in the spring, the, the time period of focus was pretty similar. So getting even closer to that little period of time and looking now at the BDA influenced data as the dark blue, uh, control data as light blue and Chalk Creek as this light blue dotted line, we see that zooming in again, the stream flow is pretty similar for all of those data collection sites. The orange clusters represent change points, which are just a change in the trend of whatever data you're looking at. And this analysis was done by Logan Jamison, and he found that there were two clusters of change points in this window of time. First was this mid-July change point. Chuck Creek was a couple of days later than the Fish Creek points, but they were all within 48 hours of each other. And then we have this other change point where stream flow actually starts to increase in late fall. And again, these change points were all within about 24 hours of each other. And then I also looked at the means of flow before and after, as well as control versus BDA and found no significant difference. So what we can take away from this data is that BDAs did not measurably change stream flow. So change is zero. Thinking just about this increase in stream flow, which was kind of interesting and at first a little bit confusing because we don't expect a large increase in stream flow, especially if you install dams. Uh, we guess that this was just natural seasonal changes that caused the second change point. So as fall starts, vegetation slows down. It's not drawing as much water from the ground and from the stream. The days are shorter and cooler. And so stream flow can be bound a little bit right there. Now moving on to groundwater. Uh, in this figure, we can notice just the stream and each star is a single dam. And the points, each point represents one of these lines in time series on the plot. So BDAs were installed August 24th. And what we see here is that the groundwater table increased in the middle of the PDA reach pretty noticeably. At these points, that increase was 30 centimeters more than any increase we saw at the control reach, which is definitely significant. Downstream from the dam and the area of outflow, there was a small increase of water flowing out, uh, but not as much as was stored in the middle of the reach. So what we can take away from this is that there was small scale stream gate storage. So in this case, there was a change. Uh, in minus out was greater than zero. There was some storage um, happening in the banks and this differs from stream flow, flow results. And I have a couple of uh, possible explanations for this. One is just that the volume of water that was actually stored isn't that huge. And so there is a, a small change, but, but not enough to make a difference in stream flow. And the second is that the storage happened over a period of a couple of weeks where the groundwater was rising slowly through time. And so that wouldn't have made us see a, a big dip in stream flow at, at any point in time when we installed the dams. And I did a, a really rough calculation on the volume that might have been stored here. And what I found was that um, the, the volume was equal to about 15% of an Olympic swimming pool. And so, you know, if you picture that in your mind's eye, it's there's definitely water stored there, but in terms of, of water use, it's it's not an enormous, enormous amount, at least for this reach and based on my really rough estimation. So now thinking about ongoing work and goals for this project, 
long-term data is needed. Here, we only have data for 2019, uh, only for one season before beaver dam analogs were installed, and then a couple months afterward. And so some long-term data is currently being collected by another partner at the University of Utah, Adam Colbertson. And so that will help us you know, constrain our findings a little bit better. We also need that Avampo transpiration data. Uh, it's easy to assume that it, you know, maybe wasn't significant enough, especially just in one season to make a big difference. But if the stream morphology changes and plants really start to grow here, as previous studies have seen, uh, Avampo transpiration could become uh, more of a significant draw on stream flow. And then we need more field sites and diverse field sites. So this stream had a groundwater table that was relatively connected to the stream, but that's not always the case. And so that could really change how the stream hydrology responds to beaver dam analogs. To conclude, stream flow does not perceptibly change after BDA installation, but groundwater table elevation does increase slightly near the stream. Evapotranspiration was not successfully measured, but it is something that we want to be thinking about going forward. And we need multi-year and multi-location data to better confirm these observed trends. But overall, I think it's a win that we don't lose stream flow. That is good news for uh, both people trying to restore these streams as well as the folks downstream who have water rights. And the groundwater storage can also be a good thing because if we store water during periods of high runoff, when we really fill the dams, just like uh, a large scale dam. Then we can use that water later, it'll seep back out of the ground and into the stream later in the season. So that groundwater storage can be beneficial as long as we know that the, the water stays in the ground and isn't sucked up and used by plants. Finally, I would like to say thank you to the organizations that uh, helped fund this work and and guide it. And thank you to the landowner, Becky Gilmore, Dave Erickson, who helped with the design of my field site and a lot of the field work and implementation, Paul Burnett at Trout Unlimited, and a ton of volunteers who installed the beaver dam analogs and helped me with field data collection um, and all kinds of data analysis and, and more. And if you have any questions for me, my contact information is here on the slide. Please reach out with questions. I'd be happy to answer them and get conversations going. And I would also like to note that we are working on a manuscript to publish this data. And so it will be available in a peer reviewed format, um, hopefully within the next six months to a year. So that is very exciting and you can keep an eye out for that.